When you hear this, what do you feel? At IMAX, you'll feel transported by our unique sound system and crystal clear images. Like you're running across a desert planet or defending your city from a surprise invasion. With immersive IMAX sound and screens curved to show more, we take fans to the edge of their seats. Get tickets to Dune Part 2 now and experience it in IMAX's exclusive expanded aspect ratio. Every year, about 200 motorists in the U.S. are killed in crashes involving deer. That's according to the Insurance Institute for Highway Safety. These fatal incidents often take place between October and December during mating season, when deer are more active. Outside of this window, it's also common to cross paths with this animal throughout the year. If you live in the suburbs, you may see a deer almost every day. While you might think of them as creatures of the forest, experts say this title is a bit outdated. From an ecological point of view, they are edge creatures. So, you know, ecologists call those ecotones, zones where one habitat kind of meets another. So you might have a place where a forest meets a meadow or an open field. That's Erica Hauser, author of The Age of Deer, Trouble, and Kinship with Our Wild Neighbors. In our modern world, we have created many, many more edges by building roads. And in the suburbs, for example, there are just edges everywhere where, you know, there might be a little bit of woods where that meets a yard or a park. Power line cuts through the woods. Those are edges. And they like those habitats because they tend to have a lot of kind of low growing, bushy vegetation. And so that's where they find the most food. It's actually easier for them to find food in those places as compared with mature woods where most of the foliage is out of reach. Hauser lives in rural Virginia, right up against a national forest, and spots deer often, but doesn't see nearly as many as her friends who live in the suburbs of Charlottesville. In general, especially white-tailed deer in the eastern U.S. are very, just very, very adaptable. They're very able to put up with noise and traffic and all the other disturbances that humans bring to the environment. So although we imagine them as sort of creatures of the deep, dark woods, they really aren't. And it turns out that they can do very, very well in and among our places that we've created. Deer have been an important provider animal for humans for thousands of years. Early humans hunted them for their meat, used their hides for clothing and shelter, and turned their bones into tools and other useful items. Hauser says that at one point, deer in the U.S. were hunted to the point of near extinction. There was just this kind of surge in hunting that happened in the 16, 1700s and into the 1800s which drove the population way down. So by the time the 20th century was beginning, the deer population North America was at an all-time low. It was so low that in many states there were no deer at all. To counter this dip, deer conservation efforts ramped up and focused in on sparse population areas. However, today it may seem like these efforts have worked a little too well. That's a conventional wisdom that you hear about deer. I had always heard that growing up in Pennsylvania. And so I knew I was going to have to investigate that. Is that true? And one of the first conversations I had about that was with a wildlife biologist here in Virginia. I said, well, are they really overpopulated? And his answer was so intriguing. He said, there are two ways to look at that. There's biological carrying capacity, which refers to how many deer the habitat can support in a sustainable way. And then there's cultural carrying capacity, which refers to how many deer people will tolerate in their environment. And these numbers are quite different from each other. She says that although deer are one of the most heavily studied animals in the world, no one knows what the actual biological carrying capacity is. There's a consensus that in some places, there are too many deer for the habitat. They have effects on, obviously, vegetation, but also on 
soil and therefore erosion and the way water runs off. And of course, if you're affecting the vegetation, then you're also going to, there's a cascade effect of insects and therefore on birds. So they can have quite an impact on a habitat. And I think there is a consensus that in some places there are too many for the habitat to support and it's going to affect the way forests are able to regenerate in the future. But as far as what that actual number is, it's, you know, you'll find a lot of different answers to that. On the other hand, the cultural carrying capacity tends to be quite a bit lower than the biological one. In other words, people want far fewer deer in their area, even if the surrounding habitat can support them. When communities find themselves coming up against that limit where vehicle collisions, that's one of the big reasons that people might start to feel like there are too many deer in our community. Also, Lyme disease is a factor and damage to landscaping plants. All these things spur people to start saying, we have too many deer, we've got to do something about it. But the idea of culling or managed hunts in suburban or urban places tends to be very controversial and very upsetting to a lot of people. So communities go through a often a pretty painful process of trying to make that decision, and it just becomes quite a mess. Hauser says these disputes stem from people's very mixed perceptions. While some may view deer as a hunting target, others take one look at the animal and see Walt Disney's Bambi. It's got to be one of the most influential films that is part of American culture because it really did set up this idea that the deer are and the other creatures are innocent and lovable and just trying to live their lives and that hunters are evil murderers, basically. And as soon as that film came out, the hunting community knew that it was going to be a PR disaster for them, and they were right. Despite the public outcry from Bambi, deer hunting is still a huge industry here. One big part of the chase is to acquire this trophy piece. If you pick up a hunting magazine, you will get the impression that mostly what people are interested in is large antlers because they're just so emphasized in the media and in that part of the hunting culture. She says laws around hunting vary from state to state, as do questions of morality. For example, some hunters put out mineral supplements for deer to make their antlers grow larger. Others plant crops that will attract the animals to their backyard, which gives the hunter a convenient place to sit and simply wait for their prey to appear. You could step over the state line and be, you know, go from a place where it's legal to bait deer to a place where it's not legal to bait deer. And these are kind of ongoing debates in the hunting world, whether these things are okay to do or not. I feel for those officials who end up having to make the call, you know, often under a lot of public pressure, because I think ethically and morally, it's just a really, really tangled difficult issue. Erica Hauser's book, The Age of Deer, Trouble, and Kinship with Our Wild Neighbors is available now online and in select bookstores. To find out more about this topic, head to viewpointsradio.org. This segment was written and produced by Polly Hansen. Our executive producer is Amira Zaveri. Our studio manager is Jason Dickey. I'm Marty Peterson. Coming up next week. It's everything from not being able to read a newspaper article to not being able to understand a job instruction manual or a credit card agreement or a lease agreement. The long-term effects of never learning how to properly read. Then. What they're basically telling us as a speaker and a listener is, hold on, I need a lot of neural activation for this. The deeper meaning behind our uhs and ums I'm Marty Peterson. And I'm Gary Price. These stories in depth on your public affairs magazine, Viewpoints. And that's Viewpoints for this week. 
Follow us on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram to learn more about upcoming shows. And find a library of past programs on Apple Podcasts, Google Play, and Spotify. Plus, you'll always find previous segments and more information about our guests at viewpointsradio.org. Join us again next week for another edition of Viewpoints. Every day, we rise, challenging ourselves to work for what we believe in. At U.S. Border Patrol, protecting our borders is more than a job. It's a calling. Agents answer the call, working together to keep our country and communities safe. If you are ready for a new mission, join U.S. Border Patrol and go beyond. Learn more at cbp.gov careers.